President Biden blocked an attempt by his predecessor to withhold documents from Congress about the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol. The decision likely setting up a legal and political battle over executive privilege. And it comes as Steve Bannon says he will defy a subpoena from the January 6th House Committee at the direction of the former president. Pushed to the limit with COVID cases and hospitalizations down and the country one step closer to a vaccine for children, many wondering if the pandemic could soon be over. But it comes as a battle rages over vaccine and mask mandates. Tonight, the shocking images from schools across the country of parents attacking teachers and staff over mask policies. Plus, the new body cam footage showing the moment officers found three young children who had been lost in a national forest for more than 24 hours. How authorities finally found them. The raging river rescue, a mother and her three kids trapped in rising waters, climbing on top of their car. Crews jumping into the water to save them. Also tonight, a child labor investigation, the food staple in one country produced by exploited children. One young girl saying she works 15 hours a day, seven days a week. And road rage, the tourists coming face to face with a massive bear. Top story starts right now. And good evening, I'm Tom Yamas. We begin top story with the brewing battle in Washington. President Biden today rejecting an attempt by former President Trump to assert his executive privilege. Trump trying to withhold a batch of documents from a House committee investigating the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol. They cover his actions and communications on that date, including his rally before the riot began. The former president releasing a scathing response, slamming the investigation as fake and calling Biden's decision a, quote, dangerous assault on our Constitution. This as some of the former president's top allies, including Steve Bannon, challenged subpoenas from the January 6th House Committee at the direction of Trump's lawyers. Let's get right to NBC's Vaughn Hilliard, who leads us off tonight. Let's go! Let's go! Tonight, a White House face-off over the January 6th riots on Capitol Hill. President Biden now rejecting former President Trump's effort to assert executive privilege. Trump's maneuver would have prevented congressional investigators from obtaining documents related to the attack. The president has determined that an assertion of executive privilege is not warranted for the first set of documents from the Trump White House. The National Archives now free to prepare to hand over presidential documents to the committee about the siege on Congress. You'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. Hundreds charged with storming Capitol Police, many waving Trump flags, 140 officers injured, five killed in the violence. Four Trump allies subpoenaed to testify next week. The former president telling them to refuse. Steve Bannon wants his chief strategist today following Trump's wishes, saying he will not yet hand over documents or testify. But two close allies are apparently breaking with the former president, cooperating with congressional investigators. Trump's former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, who was with the president the day of the attack, in Kaj Patel, the former chief of staff to the secretary of defense, are so far engaging with the select committee. That, according to two committee members. Does engaging mean that they're being forthright and complying, though? Whether it's, you know, genuine good faith from a place of wanting to be helpful or because there's leverage, because you understand that there could be a negative consequence if you fail to comply. And it sounds like they're at least in some way incentivized to try to make some progress here. As Trump wrestles with the ongoing probe into the January 6th riots, he's also tapping into his political playbook, calling into Fox News and going after his own party's leadership, attacking Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell after he compromised with Democrats on debt ceiling negotiations, calling for him to go. The Republican Senate needs new leadership. I've been saying it for a long time. Mitch is not the guy. He's not the right guy. He's not doing the job. All right, Von Hillier joins us now. We know that there was a lot of back and forth between both presidents' legal teams. Bottom line here, how quickly do we think those congressional investigators will get their hands on those documents? Right. The big thing is we now expect Trump, the former president, to file a lawsuit. What does this ultimately get him? It may get him a couple of months in which this is held up in the courts. Those documents still expected to reach those congressional investigators, but at the least bet he would be able to hold this process up a little bit more. We saw some in Trump's inner circle appearing 
to sort of work with the congressional investigators. Steve Bannon defined that subpoena. What's going to happen there? Exactly. Steve Bannon's lawyer said that they want to let the courts decide that, in fact, that Donald Trump's assertion of executive privilege is not valid. So essentially, he is prebutting a lawsuit coming from Trump, saying that we will wait before we turn over the documents. The deadline was yesterday to turn over those documents. He did not comply. And next week, each of those four former Trump officials are set to appear for depositions. What it sounds like from C. Bannon is that he will not be showing up. Vaughn Hilliard leading us off on Top Story. Vaughn, thank you. We now turn to the battle against COVID and the fight over mandates. As COVID cases drop nationwide, wide. There's a new pushback against mask and vaccine requirements and questions on whether they are even necessary. Here's NBC's Gabe Gutierrez. In Knox County, Tennessee, the fight over mask mandates is raging from bus stops. And you have three minutes to speak. To school board meetings. Having my child's education held hostage for an agenda is not right. Florida has fined eight school districts for imposing mass requirements. In Oregon, a judge has denied a state trooper's request to block a vaccine mandate, while the sheriff in Los Angeles says he won't enforce the county's vaccine requirement among his deputies. I don't want to be in a position to lose 5-10% of my workforce overnight on a Mac vaccine mandate, while at the same time our bare bones with uh, the funding effort. I'm calling in more employers to act. The tension comes as President Biden appeals for more private companies to require vaccines. About a quarter of eligible Americans still haven't gotten their first shot. That's why I've had to move toward requirements. But as new COVID cases and hospitalizations plummet across much of the country, some public health experts are now wondering whether we're beginning to see the start of a transition from a pandemic to the virus becoming endemic. An endemic disease is one that constantly lurks in your population. You can't omit the germ completely. You can't get rid of it totally, but you can control it. How will we know when we get there? <laughs> I think we'll know it when we see it. When we see hospitalized cases and new cases at a sustained, really low level, if that rate of positives is below 5%, then we think this virus is just smoldering. Nationwide, the weekly COVID test positivity rate is now around 6%. It's fallen from about 10% early last month. We're going from pandemic to endemic, and that means we will be coping with this virus for years to come. We're happy to have you. We're for business owners, coping may look much different depending on where you live. If this becomes endemic, wow. I hate to think of what that means. Melba Wilson runs a Harlem restaurant that requires proof of vaccination to dine indoors. In the beginning it hurt, we did lose quite a bit of business. However, moving forward, I think people are kind of sort of getting used to it. I'm hoping that this is something that will be ended, hopefully within the next few months or so. All right, Gabe Gutierrez joins us now. Gabe, back to that vaccine mandate you were mentioning. The L.A. County Sheriff will not enforce the county's vaccine requirements for officers, for his officers. And police departments across the country are grappling with whether to implement them for their officers. Yeah, that's exactly right, Tom. Here in New York, the NYPD, the nation's largest, says that about two-thirds of its officers have had at least one shot. But this is despite a mandate for city workers that went into effect last month. It does not apply to cops so far. The police commissioner here says that he does support a vaccine mandate, though. Tom? Gabe Gutierrez for us tonight. Gabe, thank you. We want to turn to the economy now and a disappointing new jobs report. While experts predicted a fall recovery, the job growth has slowed down to a crawl and Republicans are sounding off. NBC's Peter Alexander has more. Yeah, Tom, so this was the second month in a row that the numbers have been below expectations. This month, the number of 194,000 jobs that were added, the expectations had been that it would be closer to 500,000. You can see the unemployment rate also fell to 4.8 percent. That's the first time uh, in more than a year that the number has been below 5 percent. But a lot of the reason for that is because people have been leaving the sort of effort to try to find jobs at this point. The biggest factor right now that's keeping people from going out and finding work, not that they're there's not work out there. A lot of companies, restaurants, retail, they're all looking for workers right now. But it is the coronavirus, that Delta surge over the course of the last month, having a real impact here. I was in the room when the president was speaking here at the, at the White House earlier, and he said that these figures are really a snapshot of almost a month ago. And he says, in fact, that the virus has gotten a lot better. The case counts have come down over the course of that time. The White House is optimistic that the numbers will continue to improve 
into the future. So who is looking for workers right now? If you're one of those people looking to find work or have a loved one who is retail, restaurants, transportation and healthcare, education as well. In many cases, they've been raising wages, Tom, offering better benefits to attract and to keep workers. Take leisure and hospitality just for one good example here. The wages across that industry are now up more than 10 percent versus a year ago. Tom? Yeah, I want to talk to you about that, though, Peter, because you bring up a good point here. We're still about 5 million jobs down since before the pandemic. Vaccines are widely available. The COVID numbers are coming down. As you just mentioned, wages are going up in some cases. What does the Biden White House think industries have to do more to attract that sort of pocket of workers that still that aren't coming back? Well, at the end of the day, the White House believes that COVID is really the driver here. They feel strongly that as the numbers improve, the case counts come down across the country, that workers will be more comfortable going back to the office right now. I spoke to one woman today who lost her job at the height of the pandemic. She says she has now applied for 300 jobs, 300 jobs over the course of the last year. But she wants a job that she can do from home because she now has a 10-month-old baby. And she says it's made it infinitely more challenging for her to try to find that opportunity. Tom. Peter Alexander at the White House for us tonight. Peter, thank you. There is a lot of news on the economy tonight. So to help us out, CNBC Global Markets reporter Seema Modi joins Top Story right now. Seema, talk us through the jobs report. Experts had projected 500,000 new jobs. We saw that in Peter's report. Is this report a cause for concern? It's a disappointing report for sure, Tom. It shows that employment decreased by 144,000 in local education and by about 17,000 in state education on a seasonally adjusted basis. Difficulty in hiring for certain positions such as drivers, food service workers, that remains a point of concern. Public schools, keep in mind, which often fuel the September jobs report as districts rehire teachers, bus drivers, proved a drag on last month's report as COVID remains a challenge for the education sector. And of course, this report, the timing of it is crucial crucial as we tried to recover as the U.S. economy and also deal with some major supply chain bottlenecks ahead of the holiday season. So Seema, you know, I know the market is not the economy, but today's numbers didn't make a big impact on Wall Street. What do investors see for the months to come? So optimism about a short-term debt ceiling seemed to trump a disappointing job support in terms of today's market action. There's also hope that a not-so-strong labor market could actually hold a Federal Reserve back from tapering its asset purchase program. That, I think, has played a meaningful role in sort of driving the stock market over the past couple of months. Another big factor in driving stocks higher is energy. That is the best-performing sector on the week and over the past month, as, again, these port disruptions and supply chain concerns drive the prices of oil and natural gas uh, higher over the coming months. Seema, we thank you for that. We want to turn now to politics where lawmakers on Capitol Hill voted to temporarily raise the debt limit. If you think getting a deal would make lawmakers happy, you're wrong. Members of both parties fighting with their own, some right in front of the cameras. NBC's Leanne Caldwell explains. We voted. We've averted the fiscal cliff. Congress on the verge of a self-made disaster. Late last night, they avoided a debt crisis, but not without some fireworks and finger pointing. A Republican senator blaming his own party. In the game of chicken, Chuck Schumer won this game of chicken. After weeks of intense debate, Minority Leader Mitch McConnell and 10 Republicans relented, allowing Democrats to pass a bill that would temporarily lift the debt ceiling by $480 billion. Just after the vote, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer took a victory lap. Republicans played a dangerous and risky partisan game, and I am glad that their brinksmanship did not work. Sitting right behind Schumer, Democratic Senator Joe Manchin, who tried to bridge the divide between the two parties, visibly frustrated. The civility is gone, okay, and I'm not going to be part of getting rid of it. Republican Senators Mitt Romney and John Thune then had words with Schumer right on the Senate floor. I let him have it. Well, I just thought it was an incredibly partisan speech after we had just helped them solve the problem. With the nation's economy hanging in the balance, nerves were frayed. And lawmakers will need to find common ground again and quickly. The vote only gives Congress two months to come up with a longer-term solution to the debt limit problem. What does it say about the way we run our government if we're going to lurch from month to month on funding it, on keeping the debt manageable? I mean, This country was founded by geniuses, but it's being run by idiots. 
All right, with that quote right there, a snapshot of Washington in 2021. Leanne Codwell joins us now from Capitol Hill. Leanne, I'm curious, do we know yet why Republicans changed course and allowed this vote to go through? Well, Tom, all Republicans weren't happy with it, but ultimately it came down to a decision by Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. And what he told his conference behind closed doors is that he wanted to preserve the filibuster. Now, Democrats had been seriously considering getting rid of that 60-vote threshold in order to lift the debt limit, and that's something that R McConnell just did not want. But, Tom, there's something else at stake, too, and that is that donors— CEOs and business groups were also getting extremely anxious that Congress was cutting this so close to that debt limit deadline, and a decision had to be made, and a deal was reached. Tom. Leanne Caldwell on Capitol Hill for us tonight. Leanne, thank you. We turn now to the search for Brian Laundrie. Authorities returning to the sprawling Florida wildlife refuge. Laundrie's father recently joined them to show investigators his son's favorite camping spots. Laundrie has been missing for nearly a month. He is wanted for questioning in the disappearance of his fiance, Gabby Petito. Her death ruled a homicide. Some missing experts say he's likely fled Florida with some help. Dr. Brianna Fox is a former FBI agent and an expert in forensic psychology. She joins us now from Tampa, Florida. Dr. Fox, thanks so much for joining Top Story tonight. We've covered this case in depth here, and just this week, we had a hiker tell us he's 99% sure he ran into laundry on a trail in North Carolina. He also spoke to the FBI, but now they're back in Florida searching again. What do you think's going on? Well, first of all, thanks, Tom, for having me. And I think there's a few things that are going on here. The first is this could be a very credible lead. Somebody saw something and said something just like we wanted. So there, I'm sure the FBI and local law enforcement are tracking down that lead. And that has a lot of implications for this case. For one, if he is in North Carolina, he didn't do it by himself. How did he get there? He didn't walk, so somebody gave him a ride, somebody helped him there. He's getting financial assistance or something that they can track. So that can help understand more about who's helping him and what we could be looking for in the future. But the other op option is, well, is he actually in North Carolina? Is he possibly, uh, that was just a false identification and he's still here in Florida. And I'm sure that's what authorities are looking through the reserve for right now to see not only if he's actually really there, but is there any missing clues that they didn't see initially? Or is there anything else that could have been overlooked in, in their first pass that could link him to this case? In your experience, what will it take for authorities to find him at this point? Does he have to make a mistake? And in your gut, where do you think he is? Well, in my experience working fugitive cases, um, they're very difficult to get away with forever. Um, it's basically the balance is on the side of law enforcement in the long run. For them to get away with this forever, they have to be perfect 100% of the time. If they make just one mistake, that's something that law enforcement can use that will break open this case. And so the person who is going to get away with this forever has to get lucky always. For law enforcement to catch them, they only have to get lucky once. And in your gut, where do you think he is right now? Well, it doesn't seem likely after how much they've been looking in Florida that he's either there and alive or that he is somewhere else and he has help from somebody that's very close to him within his inner circle. So I think that in the coming days and weeks, we're going to find out a lot more. But the idea that he would be able to get away with this as such a new offender on the run uh, forever is very unlikely. So I think law enforcement will get lucky here soon. Dr. Brianna Fox for us tonight. Dr. Fox, thank you. Still ahead, flash flooding rescue. Take a look at this video. First responders jumping into a raging river to save three children and their mother. How the family got trapped in the rushing water. Plus the calls to pull Dave Chappelle special from Netflix. The comedian known for poking fun at cancel culture now facing his own back backlash. What's behind it and how he's responding. And the moment police found a group of young kids after they spent more than 24 hours lost in a national forest. Priscilla Thompson is in the house. She joins Top Story with more on the police body cam footage just released. Stay with us. Next on Top Story returns on the dramatic body cam capturing the moment a police deputy rescued three children who were missing in a forest overnight. Those kids taking shelter under a fallen tree until help arrived. Priscilla Thompson has the latest. 
Kids, I'm the police. Are y'all ready to get out of the woods? Tonight, dramatic video showing the moment a police deputy in Texas rescued three children lost in a forest overnight. They were down in the creek bottom all night. The kids, all under the age of seven, reported missing after leaving their homes to play last week. Their parents calling deputies when they realized the children were gone. Multiple agencies scouring the area with hundreds of officials racing to find them. Come on, kids, come to me. Meanwhile, according to police, a local Good Samaritan also went searching for the children. Been looking all night long. Finding them at around 9.30 a.m., about a mile from where officials believe they entered the National Forest. Deputy Jason Smith was first on the scene, venturing into the woods. The children spending the night under a fallen tree where they'd taken shelter. You gonna be able to make it? You need some help? Guiding them out of the brush. You're doing good, bud. Great I'm, job. I'm trying my best. You're doing a great job. And making sure they didn't get lost again. Don't get too far ahead, okay? I don't want to lose you again. The group emerged after 20 minutes, joining the first responders who were waiting. What? There you go, buddy. Look at you. You made it. Authorities say the children were checked by emergency workers, then finally reunited with their families after a rainy night in the wilderness. Good job. Good job, buddy. We made it, huh? So great they found those kids. Priscilla Thompson joins us now in studio. And you were telling us there were actually some dramatic moments even after they found the kids. Yeah, so those kids were in a really remote area. And so the deputy that found them actually had to use a compass on his iPhone to sort of get them out. At one point, listening to the sirens of his colleagues who were on the outside of that force to sort of guide him out. Uh, and the deputy uh, is now actually a sergeant. He was promoted after that incredible rescue. Yeah, he deserves it. So he found the kids and he got a promotion. All right, Priscilla. Well, thank you so much. When we come back, the child labor investigation. Tortillas, one of Guatemala's food staples, but are they produced by exploited children? And the climate crisis destroying one of the world's most famous mountain ranges. Our Keir Simmons takes us inside the Swiss Alps as glaciers melt at an alarming rate. Stay with us. All right, back now with Top Stories Newsfeed, a roundup of what's making headlines in the U.S. And Puerto Rico has declared a state of emergency over its power generators. The island's power authority says the generators are in critical condition, resulting in constant and widespread blackouts. Puerto Rico's energy system has been plagued by debt, political interference, and the effects of Hurricane Maria. The power authority is also in bankruptcy. Three children and their mother rescued after flash flooding swept through Tennessee. Take a look at this new video. It shows crews jumping into a raging River with three small children after the family got trapped inside their car. Police say the mother tried to drive through flooded roads and ended up in the river. Everyone was pulled to safety. Dave Chappelle is responding to the backlash over his new Netflix special. Activist groups calling for Netflix to pull the closer over the comedian's remarks about the trans and LGBTQ community. The showrunner for Dear White People saying she is done with the streaming platform for allowing what she called, quote, blatantly and dangerously transphobic content. At a live performance last night, Chappelle said, quote, if this is what being canceled is like, I love it. And the shocking moment for a group of tourists in Japan, new video shows a bear charging at a car and trying to climb on the hood. The car had stopped to let the bear and two cubs cross the road. The bear eventually walking away. No injuries were reported. And a special pair of Nikes are going up for auction. Check these out. The size 13 1984 Nike Air ships were worn by Michael Jordan during one of his first NBA games. They are expected to fetch $1.5 million at auction later this month. The signed sneakers were given to a former ball boy by Jordan himself. All right, turning now to money talks, what consumers and investors need to know from the business world and beyond. And this year is not the time for last-minute holiday shopping. Supply chain issues worldwide might affect the gifts your kids want and, the, what, and it may cost you. Here's NBC's Stephanie Rule. If the idea of starting your holiday shopping now is sending shivers down your spine, you may want to grab a blanket. Don't wait for tomorrow. Buy whatever you need today. Jack Cohen, owner of S.W. Randall Toy Store in Pittsburgh, has been in business for 51 years. I can't get a lot of it. 
He's bracing for a holiday shopping season like no other. The reason? Supply chain issues. It's all stuck at the harbor. He only receives about 50% of what he orders. Add in inflation. Most of the stuff is going up around 10%. We tried to order early, you know, before the prices went up. But uh, what can we do? We just have to pass it on. And that is exactly why Shaylin Matthew Severe has already started Christmas shopping for her nine-year-old son. What was Christmas like for you growing up? Christmas was the best time of the year. Um, just gathering around the tree, opening gifts. Everybody had like piles of their own section. But I told my son this year, it's kind of like you get what you get. Have you noticed that prices are higher? Oh, yes. We actually just picked up a board game not too long ago. The game was $35. Um, that was ridiculous. <laughs> Reports from Goldman Sachs show the toy makers Hasbro and Mattel are raising prices to offset inflation. To illustrate why, our colleagues at CNBC tracked Care Bears made in China, where manufacturing costs are up 25 percent since January. And once in the U.S., moving the Care Bears by rail cost 225 percent more than in 2019. And trucking rates are up 91 percent, all of it driving up costs for Care Bear maker Basic Fun. To ensure you don't break the bank this holiday season, be flexible on which brands you buy. Set expectations for your little ones now. And take Jack's advice. Shop early. Stephanie Rule. Hey, take care. NBC News. And thanks, Stephanie, for that. We now want to turn to the Americas, focusing on stories from the U.S. and across Latin America. And tonight we take you to Guatemala, where a troubling new investigation shows that thousands of miners are being exploited in tortilla shops around the country, many of them indigenous girls working long hours and often receiving no pay along the way. Tortillas are a staple in Guatemalan meals, often sold across the country in shops just like these. But a new investigation is now suggesting that the hands who are making them might be young indigenous girls, exploited, forced to work long hours in tortilla shops across Guatemala. Tengo 14 años. Tengo un año de estar trabajando aquí. Mis papás me mandaron a trabajar. Hidden away from the tortilla shop owner, our partners at Telemundo spoke with a teenager who described the long hours and harsh working conditions she's subjected to on a daily basis. Nos hacen trabajar de las 5 de la mañana para las 8 de la noche. Lo tratan mal a uno. Lo castigan, no lo dejan salir. An investigation by the Pan American Development Foundation shows that thousands of underage indigenous children, mostly Mayan girls, have never received a penny from their employers. El dinero se lo depositan a él, a mi papá. Yo de ese dinero no veo nada porque... A él se lo depositan directamente. No sé qué hacen ellos con el dinero. The investigation specifically looking at 292 tortilla companies who have recruited miners from rural areas prone to extreme poverty. They're earning roughly $120 U.S. a month. Um, which works out to really pennies. This is probably around 50 or 60 cents an hour. The nonprofit says many of the young girls they spoke to weren't even receiving the minimum wage by Guatemalan standards, claiming almost 60 percent of the girls worked 15 hours daily and 63 percent of them worked seven days a week. Organizations that work to protect children's rights say it's often difficult to rescue many of the minors because they work with the consent of their parents. You have extreme levels of poverty and a very low level of employment, so I don't think it's the intention of the parents to exploit their kids. I think it's, it's their dire necessity, really, that pushes them to do this. The investigation adding that the majority of the girls aren't receiving an education. 70% of those girls saying they wish they could attend a school. Guatemala is currently seeking to enact a law that will prohibit minors under 18 from working. But until then, many of these young girls and their families are left with few other options. Sticking with the Americas now, next we move on to the end of Hispanic Heritage Month, and we want to take a look at the history-making Latinos working inside the White House. But in the first year of the administration, they faced a border crisis and a pandemic that affected Hispanics more than other Americans. MSNBC anchor Alicia Menendez met with those key cabinet members for her special American Voices, Latinos Inside the White House. Alicia, thank you so much for joining Top oh, Story. So fun to be with you. Yeah, so I, I want to know, this special is a great idea. What are viewers going to learn? I think 
think one of the first things they're going to learn is just how many senior level Latinos there are in the Biden administration. That includes four members of the president's cabinet. They're also going to learn about these individuals, who they are, where they come from, and how those lived experiences now shape their policy decisions. You know, I want to go to the elections. One of the things we heard from a lot of groups that were trying to get votes out for the Democrats was that Democrats were taking the Latino vote uh, not seriously, right? They were taking it for granted. And we saw that in areas like Florida, areas like the Rio Grande Valley, even Arizona. What do you think this administration is trying to do to make sure they do better with Latino voters, especially with Latino voters who were Democrats but maybe voted for Trump in 2020? You know, one of the things I think you're saying is that, and we hear very often about this community, is that we are not a monolith. And sometimes we mean that in terms of country of origin. Sometimes we mean that in terms of the fact that some of us are English dominant, some of us are Spanish dominant, some of us speak, speak indigenous dialects. That is also true when it comes to policy. What is a Latino issue? So you may be a Latino in this country who's very invested in two-year free community college. That's something that Secretary Cardona, the Secretary of Education, is very committed to. You may be a Latino in this country who's also a small business owner who wants to see your PPP loans forgiven. You may be a Latino in this country who is fired up about immigration. And so I think part of what you see is the administration treating a whole host of issues as though they are issues that Latinos care about. You know, we have covered, both of us have covered the issues uh, facing migrants who go to detention centers in the U.S. and the conditions they face, especially with children. I know this is an issue that you brought up with the White House. It was. You know, when we talk about immigration detention, most of that happens under the Department of Homeland Security. But in this case, I wanted to know about children in immigration detention. That, of course, under the purview of Health and Human Services. I asked Secretary Becerra about it. Take a listen. I also want to talk just a little bit about minors in immigration detention centers because there have been a number of whistleblower reports, reports that kids were burned with scalding water, threatened kids with no clean underwear, allegations of sexual misconduct. What has accountability looked like in those instances? I am the son of immigrants and I understand well the immigrant experience. Um, I made it very clear to my team, we're going to treat a human being, especially a child, the way we would expect a child to be treated. And I want to be very clear, that's exactly what we've done. These are children who've come with, through, through some very difficult means, with traumatic experiences that they're carrying. We're doing everything we can to make sure that not only do we follow the law, but we follow our moral compass in how we do this. Tom, that begs a bigger question, of yeah. course, which is in an immigration system that purports to be fair, orderly, and humane, do children ever belong in detention? I pose that to the secretary. He pivoted to a legislative solution. All of these huge challenges facing the administration. You know, finally, do you think the Hispanic members of the administration, especially in the White House, do they understand their role and, and the importance that they play, not only for serving President Biden, but serving the rest of the, of the American people and, of course, Hispanic Americans? I got the sense that they have an extreme and profound sense of responsibility and that they know, even the ones who are making history by being the first one, that they have a responsibility not to be the last, and also that they're stepping into these roles at a critical moment in American history, whether you're talking about the pandemic, whether you're talking about an asylum system that the former administration uh, really began to dismantle. They have a lot of work to undo and then to begin to do. All right, Alicia Menendez, thank you so much for joining Top Story. We do appreciate it. And watch American Voices Latinos inside the White House Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern on MSNBC. All right, we want to turn now to some international news in another part of the world, the Swiss Alps, where giant glaciers are disappearing fast. Here Simmons reports on the dramatic change it's causing on the landscape and how some locals are fighting back. Across Europe's world-famous mountain range, glaciers are in retreat. 500 gone forever. Like the Rhone, an 11,000-year-old avalanche of ice now shrinking dramatically. Landlocked Switzerland has been warming at twice the global rate. In the past 10 years, 20% of the Alps' so-called eternal ice has been washed away. These 150-year-old hotels were built at what was then the foot of the Rhone Glacier. Now the Rhone is reachable only on steep, winding alpine roads. Today, scientist Matthias Hutt leads a team 
who monitor the relentless retreat almost a mile in 120 years. So this was about 2005, I would say. The glacier still filled up this whole um, region we see here. The water here is where this glacier was. Yes, once. exactly. He first saw the Rhone Glacier aged 11. I still find this glacier beautiful, although it's, it's so different than it used to be 30 years ago. And he says his children may see almost all the 1,500 that remain in the Alps disappear. You can see it with your own eyes in your own lifetime. Exactly, you can see it and it's much more obvious than seeing just a graph with rising temperatures. Desperate to save tourism and the glaciers, locals have spread UV-resistant white blankets to reflect the sun, slowing the thaw by up to 50%, protecting these beautiful ice caves against all the odds. Look. You can see it. And you can hear it melting. But to see the most dramatic example, Local guide Andrew takes me on a long trek further up. My grandfather, he was mountain guide. 100 years ago, the glacier came down to this valley. Wow. He saw that? 20 years ago. There was no, no lake. With the glacier gone, the only way to cross is the Trift Bridge. This changing environment will impact our lives. The world's glaciers store almost three quarters of our fresh water. If you're brave enough to look down, you realise how deep the glacier was. It's all gone. All gone. Complete transformation. Now it's so fast. What would your grandfather say if he was here now and saw this? He couldn't believe this. But the Swiss are fighting back and turning adversity into opportunity. This is the Oberar Dam. 7,550 feet up in the Alps. It's also the climate change equivalent of taking lemons and making lemonade. That melting glacier is putting water into this lake from which they're creating renewable energy. To see it up close, you have to go a mile under the mountain. So these are glaciers and then we're here underneath the lake. Yeah, that's right. Our tour of one of Switzerland's many hydroplower plants. OK, come in. Uh, oh, wow. here. Look at this. Ends in the heart of the operation, the massive turbine room. How much of Switzerland's energy comes from power stations like this? 60%. From? Water. Water. Water, much of which comes from glaciers melted by our warming climate contributing to 4% of the country's total hydropower output, a promising twist that is leading to production of clean energy in the future. Now everybody is talking about uh, what can we actually do and how shall we change. So at least there is discussion now and then I hope that the actions will follow and they will still be early enough to prevent uh, extreme climate change. That's hopeful, a little bit. We need to be hopeful because it's our own way. It's too late to save many of these majestic oceans of ice, but not too late to save our planet. And Tom, I am standing now in front of the Rhone Glacier. You can see where pieces of the ice have broken away, but not just that. Come here and see, Tom, this rock is smoothed out. That tells us the glacier was once here, but not just here. Where that waterfall is, right across the rock face there, and right down here, into the valley 150 years ago. What the experts have told us, Tom, is that while the glaciers melting will not themselves contribute to ocean levels rising drastically, not the way the Arctic melt will, they are a warning because you can see it. You can see the effects of climate change. Tom? Keir Simmons showing us there, as he put it, glaciers in retreat. Keir, thank you. Coming up, another victim of climate change, America's moose population devastated by ticks. And our Carrie Sanders goes into the woods of Maine to explain what's happening. Back now with new reporting on the impact of climate change on wildlife. Scientists say the warming planet is not only causing more costly natural disasters, but it's also devastating some animal populations. And one group suffering right now, moose. Kerry Sanders is in Maine with those details. 
Majestic, magnificent, but here in Maine, moose are in peril. But we're getting October, November weather where we're getting 70 degrees into the 80s. And every day it's warm out. I know what's going on in the woods today. What's going on is climate change. Biologists in Maine say winters are now two weeks shorter than they once were. That gives the blood sucking ticks that only target moose 14 extra days to latch onto them in numbers never before seen. Now you got 60,000 ticks taking blood on you at so a time of year where you're trying to make it through with your fat reserves. So they're weakened? So they're weakened, they're anemic. Those thousands of ticks are drawing an astonishing 15 gallons of blood from the moose every two weeks, close to half of a moose's total blood supply. Increasingly, moose, especially the calves, are dying. We join state biologists on an aerial survey of Maine's northern moose territory. Off we go, and we're airborne. In this sparsely populated region, there are three moose for every resident. Oh, there's a moose down there. There's one there. Yeah, it's going to be pretty tough to see. Two decades ago, there were 100,000 moose in Maine. Now it's estimated there are only 60,000. Ticks to moose are like mosquitoes to humans. You imagine yourself out in the woods and there's mosquitoes everywhere. You don't have any bug repellent and your hands are tied behind your back. There's no way to escape those insects. That sounds very painful and in this case it can be deadly. Absolutely. Moose tours are big business, but spotting a moose, which is never easy, has become even more difficult. You don't make appointments with nature. <laughs> so you feel lucky today? Yes. Moose callers like veteran master guide Roger Lambert mimic a female moose. That's a cow. That's a cow. So right. you're trying to call the male out. Well, oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And they play act because a moose's eyesight is so poor. A comical routine that at times draws moose out of the woods. But it goes quick. See, and you do a little nasal, you know, a little stuff. Are you squeezing your nose? You, a little bit, yeah, if you need to. Damn good, Gary. That's damn good. <laughs> really? You didn't even start out with that. I learned from the best. And bingo, a moose. Those regal antlers up to five feet wide. Mother Nature in all her glory takes your breath away. In what may sound counterintuitive to save the moose, state biologists say some must be sacrificed to hunters. The theory, with fewer moose, the ticks will die. It's believed then a healthy moose population can rebuild. Scientists say this is yet one more example of cause and effect that they're seeing on animal populations around the world. Back to you. Kerry, thank you. When we come back, Top Story is getting you ready for the weekend. We're taking a look at the shows, movies, and new music you can binge right now, including something to get you in the Halloween spirit. And Callan Rosenblatt is in the house. She joins Top Story for the first time to break down what's trending and what you don't want to miss. You're watching Top Story on Friday night. Stay with us. Back now with Binge Worthy, our look at the best things to watch and listen to this weekend. At Top Story, we are always taking care of you. And helping us out today is NBC News youth and internet culture reporter, Callan Rosenblatt. Callan, thanks so much for being on Top Story. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. So I know you're starting out with a limited series that a lot of people are talking about on HBO right now. Absolutely. So uh, Scenes from a Marriage is a piece starring Oscar Isaac and uh, Jessica Chastain. Now, this got on my radar because there was a super viral moment between these two on a red carpet where Jessica Chastain had her arm over Oscar Isaac and he kind of gave her the smoldering look. From there, uh, it kind of exploded on the internet and then, you know, we actually had to watch the series. Where did this come from? So this was something that will probably make you cry just watching the trailer. It's about a marriage that's falling apart. It's sort of reminiscent to um, marriage story, but this looks a little more aching, a little more heartbreaking, a little more of two couple, of a couple rather, that is uh, kind of one to stay together but really can't and it's kind of something if you need a good cry this weekend you should tune in. <laughs> I always need a good cry. No, uh, a lot of people are talking about that show so I'm anxious to see it. I know next up we have a series that's running on Netflix that a lot of people are also talking about. I think we have a clip. Let's take a look at that. Now I'm doing my own hair, making my own hair grow. Come on. Missy, I don't take orders no more. Lincoln freed me 40 years back. That's why I'm gonna pay you. And that's why you're my favorite daughter-in-law. <laughs> 
All right, that's Self Made on Netflix. Tell, tell us more about it. So Self Made follows C.J. Walker. It is a story of the first self-made black female uh, millionaire. And something that a lot of people are, are saying online about this particular movie is it's a story of black joy and black success, where we see a lot of movies and a lot of films that sort of focus on black pain. This is a triumph for this woman who was making, uh, I believe it's hair oil, and she became a millionaire through her sales of the product. This is a story of success. This is going to be a real feel-good movie for anyone who wants to tune in this weekend. We look forward to that, and we know you have another series that will get us into the Halloween spirit. Absolutely. So the next one is called Black as Night. Now, this one is for the vampire fanatics. If you are really into vampires, but you lean a little more Twilight, a little less Buffy, this one may not be for you. This one is a tongue-in-cheek look at vampires in New Orleans. It's about a young lady who gets bit by a vampire and then has to go on to defeat them. Them. It looks fantastic. It looks like both something if you need a laugh and if you're ready for spooky season, this one is for you. Yeah, I'm more Buffy than Twilight, so I don't know if I'll like it, but maybe, right? Yeah, yeah. I okay. think you should still give it a shot if you're more Buffy. Um, I, actually, I don't even know if I am more Buffy, but uh, <laughs> I, we want to talk about music now, and you are the online expert, so explain to me the phenomenon known as Mitski. So Mitski is kind of like the definition of sad girl season. Like, if you need, again, something to cry <laughs> to, something to sort of get your emotions out. Mitski is your girl. She is all over TikTok. And I saw people online saying, you know, Mitski for this new song that she's released, that they weren't sure if she was going to go in the direction of Lord, where Lord kind of used to have these more emotional, really heartfelt songs. She kind of went a little bit happier with solar power. Mitski is keeping it all Mitski. This one is emotional. This one is heartfelt. This one is, again, we have a few criers on this show. This is another crier. All right. Sad girl season. I'm learning like so much <laughs> from this segment. Um, um, last week, we had a great uh, collaboration. We had Tony Bennett and Lady Gaga releasing a new album. And now we have another amazing collaboration. And I think we have a clip from an interview they did on Billboard. Check this out. I heard this song, and I liked the song, and wanted to, you know, add some things to it. I felt I could maybe do a little something, something. We got together uh, with, with uh, Andrew, and we were able to make it happen. Uh, I did my part at his house. Uh, and uh, we just had fun. We wanted Stevie initially to just play harmonica, and then it just grew, and, and, and then he he wasn't going to sing on it. I think he thought he'd done enough, and then I think I really wanted him to sing on it. Stevie Wonder and Elton John, so looking forward to hearing this because I haven't heard it yet. This one is unbelievable. Elton John and Stevie Wonder, I mean, they have not missed a step. This song will give you chills. They're from full choir in this, Stevie Wonder on the harmonica. The This title is Finish Line, but I saw a headline that really encapsulated this song. They are nowhere near the finish line. This is a phenomenal song. I've been listening to it on repeat. I think you will be too if you get okay. listen up. It'll maybe take you out of sad girl season. It takes you, It'll okay. take you into, into happy girl fall. All right, that's good. And then we also <laughs> have a clip of something that's coming up that so many people are talking about. Let's take a look at that. The whole world is watching for my next move. You're the number one trending topic ahead of tater tots, and the Pope followed you. Uh, wow. Okay, no, this is not the... Re is this the real... Uh, right. No, Great. I don't Thanks, think this Greg. is a Pope. Oh, I miss seeing Greg so much. Succession, uh, maybe one of my favorite shows, maybe my, my, my favorite show ever. I, I love it so much. When does it start back up, and, and what are some of the new storylines they're going to be exploring? So it's coming back later this month. I cannot wait. I have to admit that I did not start watching this until over the, uh, probably the end of the summer. Oh, wow, okay. I binged it, it in a yeah. couple days. Yeah. It's the best. I think we're going to be seeing how the Roy family is clashing after the stunner of a finale last season. Yeah. I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't caught up, who was late okay. like me. Yeah. But it's going to be a brutal season. I cannot wait to dive in. My theory is that it was all a setup. Really? It was all a setup between the dad and the son. I think. I don't know, but we'll see. Uh, um, thank you so much, Calvin. We loved having you here. You're great. Thank you so much for that. And thank you so much for watching Top Story all week. Have a great weekend, Columbus Day weekend. Have a lot of fun. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. We will see you on Monday. Take care. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.